We're so glad to see you today and thankful that you came to worship with us this morning. So let's stand if you're able to stand with us this morning and let's sing Found in You. I hope you've come prepared to worship today. Are you prepared? Let's pray together. Father, we give you thanks and praise for this opportunity to gather and sing to the one uh, in whom our salvation is based. We ask, Lord, that you pour your spirit upon us, that we will see Jesus with new eyes, that the spirit will move in our hearts in such a way that... Uh, we will give him all the praise that he is due in every aspect of this service. Help us, Father, to do so for the glory of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let's continue to uh, worship our Lord by singing what? All I have. <laughs>
your eyes this empty world will one day fade only your truth will this morning. Our scripture today, we take it from the book of Psalm, chapter 62, verses 5 through 8. Let's read together. Find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Selah. Bye. 
You know what's amazing? What's amazing is marrying off your daughter, having a wedding reception, and showing up to church the next day. How in the world does that happen? Who are you people? <laughs> if there ever was a justifiable excuse to stay home, I think that would be it. Yeah. Have you ever um, had someone share with you their faith story? Some may refer to that as a testimony. The church that Annette and I became involved with after we came to Christ would often promote the idea that one should share their faith story with everybody that they come in contact with because to not share their faith story with everyone they come in contact with is to deny Jesus. And if we deny him, he will deny us. Now, I won't go into a discussion of this mentality, but I will say that sharing our faith story or sharing our testimony is something that I have found for many individuals is uncomfortable, and uncomfortable for a number of reasons. I think one of those reasons has to do with the fact that oftentimes we are not taught how to share our story as well as what we should say when we do. Now, I know that over the years here at First Baptist, we've had a variety of different classes to teach someone how to verbally share their testimony or faith story with others. If you have been one of those individuals that have attended those classes, you would often, you would come to the conclusion that they are not typically very well attended. Why is that? Well, perhaps it's uh, because of the reason if someone teaches you how to share your faith story and what you should say, then you'll have no excuse <laughs> for not sharing it, for not doing so. You might ask, why wouldn't someone want to share their faith story? Well, typically, I found that the biggest hindrance for someone sharing their faith with others has to do with the fear of rejection. You get to a point, you share your faith story and say, hey, would you, would you like to accept Jesus? No, 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 that's okay for you, but it's not for me. I know that such fear may seem trivial, but to some, they are major hurdles that are seldom overcome. I have heard individuals share their faith story and they drone on and on and on and on and on. get to the point where you're going, wake me when you're done. Others are so brief that unless someone was already in Christ, they'd have a very hard time understanding the little that was said. Yeah, I got saved 40 years ago. Oh, yeah. Okay. Some go into great detail regarding how sinful they were before they came to Christ as if that were a badge that they wore, you know? Unfortunately, I think that there were plenty of times that I shared my faith story in such a manner. Now, I haven't done that for many, many years. Unfortunately, such sharing may give the impression that unless someone has had a very, I don't even know if I want to use the word colorful, but a kind of a seedy past, you know, then they don't have much of a testimony to share. I remember speaking in my former church um, and sharing how thankful I am for what Jesus had done for me and uh, what he is doing in my life. And I had some relatives that were from out of town that, that were in the service, uh, in particular my oldest sister's daughter, my niece. And as I was trying to share a before and after a uh, picture of what Christ has done. I used an illustration of sweat socks. I said if someone was going to wash a pair of sweat socks that were brand new and someone were going to wash a pair of sweat socks that had just been worn in a mud football game, washed them together and the same load came out and they were both brilliant white, which one would be more noticeable? The brand new socks or the ones that were dirty? 
I said, naturally, the ones that were dirty. And I tell you what, she laughed and she just got tickled because she had never heard anybody talk about sweat socks before in a worship service. It seems to me that most people uh, have this desire to listen to someone's seedy past. It seems to me that most people learn how to share their faith by listening to others. And that's understandable. That's oftentimes how we learn how to pray as well. We listen to how other individuals pray. You know, that could be a good thing, but it also can be uh, a negative thing if what is shared and how it is shared is lacking. As a pastor, over the 30 plus years that I have served in vocational ministry, I've never shamed anyone or tried to guilt anyone into sharing their faith story. Because I think that this is a very personal thing. I believe if someone is reluctant to share their story with others, it does not result in them denying Jesus. Now, I know Jesus said in Matthew 10, 32, that whoever denies him before men, he will deny them before uh, his Father in heaven. But Jesus wasn't talking about sharing faith stories. He was talking about rejecting the gospel itself. Does this mean that we never ever have to share our faith story with others? And the answer is absolutely not. We should always be ready for when God opens the, the door of opportunity for us to be able to do so. Now, I don't know if you recall, but during worship back in February, we're still examining 1 Peter. And on that, uh, that morning, uh, we examined 1 Peter 3.15, which says, But in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer. To everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Now I bring this up today because today's scripture is a great template that we can follow as far as what we should include in our faith story. And I believe that this will help you be prepared so that you can give an answer to anyone who asks for the hope that you may have in you. Again, followed by the guidelines with gentleness and with respect. Now, I notice that in today's scripture, there is a two-part, uh, two parts to this template. There is a before part, and there is and after part. And the before part is reflected in verse 3, which says, at one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. I remember listening to testimony uh, about how wicked this one particular individual was before he came to Christ. And I remember thinking to myself, I could beat that. I could beat that. I had shared with you how I was listening to an evangelist on a cassette tape on Easter Sunday, 1979. And and this individual was my age, 20 years old, and he had a background of drugs. And my sister thought that that would be good because I had that kind of background as well. And I remember listening to him about the drugs that he was involved involved with before Christ drew him to himself. And I remember thinking, I thought about what I had done, and I thought, my goodness, for what he did, he's nothing more than a choir boy. You know, and I know that that was pretty arrogant. On the other hand, I have shared uh, with an individual who was already a believer all the crud of my past life, and, and um, this individual grew up in a Christian family, accepted Christ at an early age, and after hearing uh, what I had shared with him, felt a little bad because he didn't have as good a testimony as I did. Hmm. Sometimes we do that. It's often the case with sharing and listening to testimonies. We like the sensational. 
And those who are not sensational, well, I'm going to just yawn. Let me ask you a question. Does the amount of sin an individual commits make that person more deserving of divine punishment? Does the leader of a drug cartel deserve more divine punishment than a young boy who steals a loaf of bread to feed his family because his family has no food? We happen oftentimes to think along those lines, don't we? This passage states, at one time, we too were foolish. That means all of us. No one is excluded. All of us were. There is no one who is righteous. There is not even one person who ever lived that is righteous apart from Jesus Christ. Foolish has to do with being completely lacking in good sense and in judgment as far as the things of God are concerned. Psalm 14.1 says this, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. No one means no one. At one time, all of us were in the same boat. We were all dead in our sin. We were all lost. We were all foolish. We were all under condemnation because of sin. We were disobedient. Disobedient, how so? Well, you can fill in the blank in your own life. You can fill in the blank. Your disobedience may have been directed to your parents. It it may have been directed towards rulers and authorities, to the laws of the land and so on. You know, you can fill in the blank. However, all of us were disobedient towards God and His ways. All of us. Our degrees of disobedience may vary. Our expressions of disobedience may vary. Still at one time, all of us, all of us were disobedient. Scripture says here at one time, all of us were deceived and enslaved. You know what deceived means, right? It has to do with being led astray. It means to deviate from the correct path. Our inherited sin nature, of which we were all born with, leads us into the paths of sin rather than righteousness. It has enslaved us to sin. Again, the degree and expressions of sin may vary from person to person, but Scripture says the wages of sin, you fill in the blank, you fill in the amount, is what? Jesus said in John 8, 34, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. At one time, all of us were deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. A better word for passions is lust. We talked about that last week or the week before. Lust is a strong word. Lust is a longing or strong desire for that which is forbidden. Interestingly, this word here uh, that is translated passion or lust is the same word from which we get our English word hedonism. And hedonism is a strong desire and pursuit of those things that bring us pleasure. Those things that bring us pleasure. Now, pursuing pleasure in and of itself is not wrong. There are many things that bring us pleasure, right? A beautiful sunset, a loving relationship, a fun wedding, re- uh, wedding reception, you know, those kind of things bring us pleasure. However, these are not the kind of pleasures that are being addressed because the pleasures that are being addressed are connected to those things that, are, that we lust after, those things that are forbidden by God. We lived in malice and envy. And in this context here, malice is not just the desire 
to cause ill will or injury to someone. It has to do with an underlining principle of evil itself, inherent evil. Envy means desiring something possessed by someone else, something that you want but you can't have. And envy bring, uh, breeds discontent, not love. It breeds resentment, not love. It also makes us unable to be thankful for the good that comes to others because we want it and we can't have it. And as a result, it causes us to be hated by others and it causes us to hate others. All these are examples of our depravity. Depravity that's a result of sin. Yeah, all of us are not murderers. All of us are not child molesters. All of us are not adulterers or druggies or thieves. But remember, the expression and the degree of sin may vary from person to person, but the fact remains that all of us, all of us at one time were sinners. All of us were lost. Now that's the before picture. These things should be included when we share our faith story with others because those things, we're all sinners, pertains to everybody. Everybody. In verses 4 through 7, we have the after picture. But in verses 4 and 5, we see how one transitions from the before to the after, from being lost to being saved. And it is a result of God's kindness, of God's love, and of God's mercy. In verses 4 through the beginning of verse 5, we read, But when the kindness and love of our God... Our Savior appeared. He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. All three things here are attributes of God, kindness, love, and mercy. And all three of those are expressions of God's grace. You see, kindness meets real needs according to God's timing and God's ways. Mercy encompasses forgiveness and compassion and love, while love just emanates from the very heart of God. The word appeared has to do with being seen and understood or to bring to light. This appearing is found in Jesus. This appearing is seen in his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. His appearing allows an individual to become saved. Notice carefully that salvation is not a result of any righteous thing that any of us has done. I mean, when you really stop and think about it, righteousness is an attribute of God. Because we are in Christ, we have received the righteousness of Jesus. If you are not in Christ, how in the world can anybody do anything that is righteous? Of course, it's not because of any righteousness that anyone has done. You could also make a case that salvation cannot be achieved by any amount of good works because one cannot earn their way to salvation. It's a result of kindness. It's a result of love. It's a result of God's mercy. Notice in verses, second half of verse 5 and verse 6, how salvation comes about in the life of anyone. Anyone. There are not multiple ways that an individual can get saved. Which plan do you want to go to? A, B, C, D. Sounds like Medicare. There is only one way. There is only one method. There is only one Savior. He saved us, Jesus, through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Now, this is so, so, so important to understand. 
Let's examine the first way salvation comes to us, through the washing of rebirth. There are two issues at stake here, two issues. One is a heart issue, the other is a sin issue. So let's deal with the sin issue first. Now, throughout time, water has been used symbolically as a means of cleansing. Many different religions use water, including Judaism. In Christianity, it's reflected in baptism symbolically, not literally. Baptism cannot literally wash away someone's sin. The only thing that is capable of cleansing us from sin is the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. That's why we sing the hymn, right? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not baptism, not water. In addition to this washing, rebirth is required. Another word for rebirth is regeneration. Another term for for rebirth is being born again. Scripture tells us that through Adam, all mankind is affected by sin. No one is exempt. Romans 5.12 tells us, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way death came to all men because all sinned. Sin brings death. Sin brings death that is physical. Sin brings death that is spiritual. As Ephesians 2, 1 through 5 tells us, everyone since Adam, with the exception of Jesus, is born in their transgressions and sin. No one seeks God. No one pursues Him. No one seeks to worship and glorify Him because of our fallen nature. We are incapable of doing it unless something, unless something changes. What must change? Well, I suggest to you that our spiritual nature needs to change. That's why Jesus told Nicodemus, I tell you the truth, Nick, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again, unless there is a rebirth, unless there is a regeneration. No one can renew their fallen spiritual nature. No one can become born again on their own. If that were possible, my friends, Jesus would not have had to go to the cross and die. How then does this rebirth come about? If it is indeed impossible for man to achieve, well, it can only come through the Holy Spirit, through the renewing by the Holy Spirit. The word renewing here has to do with a renewal or a change of heart and life. Life that is affected by the Holy Spirit. In other words, rebirth can only come about through God's power, not ours. Not ours. Those in Christ have this power in abundance. Because the Holy Spirit has been poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Hmm. So it's the Holy Spirit who draws us, who regenerates us. He's the one who draws us to Christ. He's the one who changes our hearts. He is the one who gives us spiritual understanding. So this catalyst here, the Holy Spirit, God's plan of salvation in the Holy Spirit is the catalyst that brings us from the before to the after. The after mentioned here in verse 7. So that having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Because we have been saved by grace, we are justified. This is a judicial term. I'm sorry you can't read that because whoever put this together didn't do a good job. But it has to do with being cleared of all charges. Cleared of all charges. I can't even begin 
to fathom that. We stand before God not as sinners condemned to death, but of those who have been made righteous through the shed blood of Jesus. His righteousness is credited to our account. Our account is cleared of all charges. And because we've been saved by grace, we have become heirs. Heirs. What does that mean? Well, heirs are those who receive their allotted possession by right of sonship. Everyone who is in Christ is an heir because we are children of God as a result of our salvation. You see, Romans 8, verses 16 and 17 tells us, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's what? Children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. We are heirs. Because we are heirs, we have the hope of eternal life. If you recall, at the beginning of this month, I a month I had mentioned that biblical hope is something that will come true because it's a strong and confident expectation. Eternal life not only refers to time without end, but it's also a term for salvation and all that salvation contains. It's something that will be experienced in its fullest sense when Jesus comes again. Time without end, we will be with him forever and ever. I already have that in my account. I will get that one day. I know it. It's a strong, confident expectation, but I don't have it right now in its fullest sense because I'm going to die someday unless Jesus comes back first. Strong, confident expectation, the hope hope of everlasting life. So there you have it. You have the before, you have the after, and you have the catalyst that transitions from the before to the after. Listen, the template is simple. It's simple and following it will cover all the essentials and it'll keep the focus where the focus needs to be. Now, what in the world do I mean by that? Sometimes when we share our testimony, we ask other individuals, do you want a happier life? Come to Jesus. Do you want more emotional stability? Come to Jesus. Do you want to just feel good about yourself or do you want to be successful? Come to Jesus. And that's where we place our focus and our emphasis. But listen, Salvation is not about being happy. Salvation is not about our emotions. Salvation deals with a sin issue. That is what is at stake. You can come to Christ. You can be justified. You can have the hope of everlasting life. And as the Holy Spirit conforms you into the image of Jesus, you'll be happier because you're following His ways and not the ways of the world. But that's not what it's all about. It's a sin issue, dealing with a sin issue. Jesus didn't go to the cross to make you happy. Focus needs to be where it is, and that's important when you're sharing your faith story. The before, how you change from the before, and what the after looks like. Begin by addressing the before. We're all sinners. We were all foolish and disobedient. We were all deceived and enslaved by our lusts and passions. Sure, you can give some examples of what that looks like if you would like, but there's no need to give an exhaustive list as if that makes you more impressive. One sin is deserving of death. Remember, it's not about the amount of sin or the degree of sin. 
Remember that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and unless something changes, one is going to remain in that spiritual condition. Address the before, something that's common to all of us. And then you can share the only way that change can come about. Through the kindness, through the love, through the mercy of God, through His grace. These are all expressed through Jesus' shed blood, through His death on the cross, through His resurrection from the dead. God has provided a way for us to become forgiven. He has provided a way for us to receive salvation, eternal life. And then you can share that this invitation can be extended to you should you choose to accept that. Mm -hmm. And then you can conclude by sharing the change that has taken place. You no longer are foolish and disobedient. You no longer are deceived and enslaved by your lusts and passions. Now you are a child of God, and as such, you're an heir. You have hope, a strong and confident expectation. You can share, hey, look it. I'm not enslaved to sin, but don't think I'm perfect, because I'm certainly not. But the Holy Spirit is making you more like Jesus day by day. You're on that right path. You can share with them that he can do the same for you because Scripture says that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, great template to follow, but let me tell you one more thing. One more thing to remember as you share your faith story. Please, please keep in mind that you are a messenger of truth and you are not the Holy Spirit. You can't renew anyone. You cannot draw one to Christ apart from Him. You cannot give anybody spiritual understanding. And you certainly, certainly cannot change hearts. What you can do is prepare. Prepare yourselves and remain prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that is in you. And then when you get the opportunity, when it presents itself, do so with gentleness and with respect. Let's consider these things. Let's go before the throne of grace with rejoicing in what, is, what has been provided for us through Jesus Christ. Let us pray that we will be committed to preparing ourselves to give a reason for the joy that is in us. Follow the template. It's simple. Also, at this time, I'm asking you to keep in mind the Marshall and the Bocock family as they deal with with some health issues with their children. Let's pray as the Spirit leads.
How do you get someone to ask you about the reason or the hope that you have in you? By showing them how God room, rules and reigns in your life. Let's stand before we are dismissed and sing together and praise God, you reign.
May this be true in all that we think, all that we say, and all that we do. God bless you. You're dismissed. Go live out your faith.